Let me, I just want to, I'm going to open it up for questions, and maybe I'll offer a couple of thoughts. We've come a long way, um, let's see. Um, and then maybe the panelists might have questions for one another, I'm not sure. One of the things that seem to come back over and over is the question of the nation state and the failure of the nation state, or the inadequacy of the very concept of the nation state as being able to, well actually at producing the crisis, if you will, there's something about the nation state form that simply does not seem to be working anymore, right? That's, that seems to be uh, one common thing. Crisis, of course, is uh, something that in various ways was addressed, um, and the way in which crises, the crisis narrative, you know, resorting to crisis narrative seems to be the way for us to make things visible. And one of the things you point, I, I guess you gesture to, is how do we get out of that? You know, what are other ways of imagining and um, reformulating what it is that we are trying to get at without taking, without resorting to these crisis narrative that, narratives that come together in various ways. Um, so from Naveen, I had, uh, Naveen actually mentioned something quite, you know, that I've also been thinking about, and in fact we've been on panels together, I think, um, thinking about how to rethink perhaps uh, the rights that we assume citizens have and how to transfer them to what we call refugees, right? I mean, because what you're suggesting is that the whole system in which you know, refugees have fewer rights than citizens is, again, something we should really rethink. Because frankly, I think the system is working. You have refugees, the system is working legally. Refugees are supposed to have certain kinds of rights. If you don't, if you are a stateless person, you are like as Hannah Arendt would have said, you know, you don't have the right to have rights, okay? If you're a refugee, if you can be acknowledged by the UNHCR, you'll get a certain set of rights. So the system kind of is working as well as it can. You know, sometimes better, sometimes not as well. So it's kind of a radical challenge. Um, I, I have, as a anthropologist, I suppose, uh, one of the questions I had, I, I, I realized that commerce and profit is really, really important. But it's, um, so uh, you talked about foreign direct investment. I think it's very, very important to note that it's not just China, but everybody has a lot of investment. And Steve, you were talking about the important players. Um, I think what I got from, one of the things I got from this is that um, this sense that we shouldn't just focus on China, but I, what can, other Euro-Americans do, I think is actually very important. And I felt it got a little bit, um, you didn't address it as much, you know. There's a sense in which the language of democracy has shielded, the idea of democracy has shielded Suchi in particular and the Burmese government. And so um, Obama, act, it was under Obama that the sanctions were lifted. We knew, I mean, those of us who were following knew what was happening in Rakhine State with the um, uh, uh, Rohingya, but it didn't matter because Burma was going to go into democracy, transition into democracy from a military dictatorship. It's an interesting thing to, and that is where I think the dominance of Euro-American ideas of democracy and freedom and human rights comes in. And I think we need to really rethink that kind of discourse that's given our and the Burmese army a lot of cover. That being said, going back to the terminology, it's interesting, and again, you pointed out um, that the Arakan army is wreaking a lot more damage or is more dangerous than our side ever could be, right? But it's interesting that what gets labeled the threat is ARSA. So, the question of labeling, and this is where Naveen, I think, was talking about the politics of naming, and who is a terrorist and who is not is something else, I think, that comes out from uh, this discussion that we need to really thinking about, think about. But beyond that, and again, this comes out in different ways, who is a human? Who is a human? I mean, this is an old question in the social sciences, but the, you know, who gets to even, you know, be labeled somebody worth saving? 
And this is where the shift in normative values that Naveen was bringing up and the connection to Islamophobia, I do think is really worth considering. Why is it that we know, this is how you start, you know, you ended up, and the world knows, as you said, everybody knows that this is happening. And the message of the film was, if we know, then people will do something. But really, this knowledge, this horrific thing, for a moment, it was so horrific on TV, you know, everybody paid attention to it, but knowing <coughs> is clearly not enough. And who is considered to be worthy of saving? These are all sort of sciencey questions, but I think they really come up with the Rohingya issue that we need to think about. So that um, I really liked the call for a boycott. I really think that structurally nothing is going to change unless we have, we being not the larger political economy system, not the, the, the so-called political uh, community has been really, really pathetic. The Euro-American donors, and of course China and its you know, allies, India, nobody is interested. But I think there is a way in which a call for boycott, even discussions of it, could be really, really important in Shifting the idea of why the Rohingya matter, because they are human, not because you know other stakes are involved. Um, finally, I had one last point about, not the boycott, um, the role of the UN. What do we do? I mean, you know, we, the UN is again something post-1945. You know, this is the system we have. The UNCHR, UNHCR, has actually been quite, quite problematic throughout in dealing with the Rohingya over and over. And it's also encouraged the Bangladesh government to do this repatriation, right? So can we think about how to deal with the UN? Anyway, those are just my thoughts that I, you know, in, I had, you know, when I was listening to all of you talk, and I wonder if any of you want to open up or respond to anything I said, or we could just open up for discussion. Let me make two points, if I may. Uh, the reason that I'm asking about it today, the BDS thing, yeah. the boycott movement, the conversation is put a pressure. So far, look at what happens. Some of the conversation, even not the direct action, part or very small <coughs> actions, have contributed to acknowledging that there have been archives, meaning the Myanmar government is acknowledging. I mentioned about Suji's post op, uh, op ad and the, and, the, and the report, the independent one. It's not a great one, of course. We should not be expecting it to be. But at least there's an acknowledgement that what crimes have been committed. Mm -hmm. So pressure does work. It might not work as much. But the BDS, if it turns out. And I mentioned about Japan. You know, look at the, I'm not talking about FBI, or you know, uh, mm -hmm. As we speak, this this last month, right? It is in January. The Myanmar and Japan have signed four loan agreements worth about 1.1 billion dollars. <coughs> this is overseas development assistance, mm -hmm. ODA from Japan. And rest of the uh, Of course, you know, the sanctions in some part, in many cases, would work, but not necessarily always. Uh, so those are the questions that I think as way forward we need to discuss at some point, at some level, somewhere. Uh, and here, that this is my opportunity to bring this up. I, I hope that it will go beyond this institution to other places. That first of all, the problem is with Myanmar. It's not a problem mm -hmm. during the crisis. It's a Myanmar's problem. Let's get to Myanmar. Mm -hmm. And the BDS is targeted toward Myanmar. That's what I want to say. Mm -hmm. Maybe the question that I would raise on that is, uh, given the incentives of mostly Asian countries to invest their geostrategic interests, their economic interests. Um, how, how do you realign those, those interests and incentives? Um, because that's where the primary markets are, that's where the investment is coming from, um, those are the, the business communities that are most active in Myanmar, um, and if the past couple of years have shown anything, it's that the Rohingya don't really matter to those constituencies. Um, so how do you how do you shift that narrative? Um, there are some very nascent discussions uh, around uh, boycotting uh, Myanmar mm -hmm. business and uh, very very early stages. Um, I, I think it's something that is 
potentially symbolically interesting, but if, uh, if the Asian countries that have stood by Myanmar's side for the past two years for economic and geostrategic interests, despite everything that's been very well documented, um, how do you shift those, those incentive structures? We do have a model in the African uh, divestment movement. I mean, it did eventually work. It's not you know, impossible. It does seem very difficult, but it's not impossible. We're trying to increase the volume. I'm not sure if everybody heard her. No. <laughs> oh, sorry, we just barely heard you. So one of the things, and I'll start with the last point very quickly, that Naveen was saying is that Bangladesh, the UN has not been Bangladesh's friend, these are her words, and that Bangladesh is seen as a durable solution to the Rohingya problem, right? And that's something that needs to be actually actively struggled against, certainly, because it becomes an easy way for, you don't actually solve the problem, right? Uh, and um, now I've forgotten what the, uh, what, what else did she say? No, one, uh, one, yeah. two, two things, I mean, keep on, I mean, I hope you can hear Oh, the boycott thing about build, building mobilization, right? Yeah. Right, you know, before that, first thing we need to acknowledge that ICJ's traditional instructions has mm -hmm. not acknowledged or designated this as a genocide. If you read all the you know, mm. there are three dissenting thing, documents in addition to the unanimous one. You need to read all those things to understand. Uh, at this point, ICJ has decided to provide this provisional direction and mm. uh, the genocide thing will be decided later. They are not agreed to it. And of course, two of the judges have actually have dissented opinion on that. Having said that, that we need to keep in mind. That not in that sense, for the, those who have left Myanmar and now staying in Bangladesh, commonly referred to as going refugees, there's nothing in, it in, in the ICJ's direction, absolutely nothing. Yeah, sure, yeah. This is for protecting 600,000 people who are inside Myanmar. That we need to acknowledge. Uh, 
So th 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 that needs to be very clear with respect to this one. Be, uh, you, you, know, you brought up <coughs> what the Asian countries can do. There are three things that I think, and maybe I'm naive, but please help me out. First thing is uh, Europe and the United States, right? Japan is a very close friend of them, right? Yeah. I talked last time, I checked. They were very close friends. How come Japan's role is absolutely contrary to this? Uh, New Delhi Washington relationship is good. Yeah. It's not very good, it is good. Mm -hmm. How come the, the, the Washington cannot actually bring this up to them? When, and I'm not asking for big thing, I'm asking for, a, if you take symbolically one individual, the Myanmar chief of army, so to speak, who has been, uh, the, sanction, the, the sanction has been imposed against him from Washington, and India and Japan is inviting. How can we make some point at least, publicly or privately? I don't know the diplomatic agenda. So these are the kind of things mm -hmm. European Union can do. Yeah. Uh, so <coughs> those are the points that I, I would like to see. And finally, the point of BDS, is it going to happen tomorrow? Is it going to change everything tomorrow? Absolutely not. I'm not going to expect that. Uh, the Asians are the ones, because actually, if you look at the number, and which I have done, I mean, I, I'm trying to focus on what to do with respect to this, and, you know, especially the, the, the Asian countries, enormous, in, uh, you know, in investment, every and everything. Uh, so it, it would be difficult, because they are the ones, they are looking for the market, and, and also the opportunities, as, as they say, in, in Myanmar. But it is not absolutely impossible to put a pressure on them because they don't only do business in Myanmar. Some of them do have investment here and there. And final point is with respect to Bangladesh, what can Bangladesh do? First thing Bangladesh should do is sign the refugee convention. Yeah. <laughs> Get it done. It has been said many, many times on the Bangladesh government. Why Bangladesh cannot do it? <coughs> what, yeah. what is stopping them? Yeah. Did you want to add something because before we open it up? Well, one thing you said is who is human and who is worthy of right. saving. But, I mean, I'm not sure that someone being seen as human makes them seen as being worthy of saving. I mean, okay, yeah. what I think that the film is a good example from last night that, like, he wasn't showing these you know, yeah. images of suffering mm -hmm. and pain yeah. that normally are seen as like the humanitarian images. Mm -hmm. And what made the film so moving is that these people were seen living normal lives. Mm -hmm. And so it's more of a, um, I mean, you see the, I don't know, the potential that's being lost or something like that. And so we need mm -hmm. to come up with different representations than just right. uh, bare human. Absolutely, I, I think. But being human is sort of the minimum kind of thing to even get the, I really only meant get the international system mm -hmm. even going and their imagery going of, um, okay, we can have, we should have a maybe more elaborate discussion on this. I'm going to open it up, we have almost mm -hmm. half an hour. I think, yes, for questions. And I'm hoping people have questions. I see my brewer's hand up. Yeah. Um, just a point of reference, um, because I know this discussion has happened. I was going to mention it when I picked it up. Um, there is actually a, a, a boycott that's already been established. Um, uh -huh. um, so uh, Yasmin from Clear India Coalition and Resisting Green kind of put together something mm -hmm. um, since August last year. Okay. And we really focus um, at the Tokyo 2020 ah. Olympics this year. Um, ah. Singapore is the number one target. The second, uh, second target is Japanese industries as well, things like curing mm -hmm. beer, Japanese tobacco, um, mm -hmm. and the and investment there as well. So it's definitely on the radar, and we invite everyone else here, because it's mostly made up of activists, uh, human rights yeah. activists, families, human rights activists as well. Um, but I would definitely recommend anyone from an academic background to also, um, and institutions to also uh, uh, to join the board on, on that as well, because I think the more uh, strength that we can have, the better it will be. Um, you know, on just a second point as well, this is more of a question to the panel as well. In regards to Boston Chart, as you mentioned, it is absolutely an experiment. Um, what what kind of uh, processes do we have that we can charge 
uh, not just Bangladesh, but also the United States and the British uh, infrastructure assistance as well, uh, to persuade other ones from this, because it seems like it's going to happen regardless. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't know if it'll happen regardless. It's already been delayed all of these times. Uh, but in any case, it's, I still think it's the crisis that is providing the uh, conditions for linking climate engineering and humanitarianism. And so if we can get out of the mode of crisis and specify what's going on and you know, de-link the issue of Rohingya from environment, then that would be a start. I mean, one of the things you always hear in Bangladesh when you talk to people about the camps is the deforestation and the environmental destruction that the Rohingya are responsible for, evidently, in, in that part of the country. But, I mean, that's precisely a, an outcome of their confinement to the camp. Uh, so it's kind of a paradox. But if we can find a way to, like, break the environment humanitarian link, I mean, that's the only answer I have. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, wow. Uh, maybe we can take a few questions, two or three questions together. Shirinapa, and then I'm sorry, I saw a hand over there. Yeah. No, it was just a comment in connection with the Marshall Stone discussion that there is a context to remember, which is a large part of the coastal population of Bangladesh live in equally precarious, if not more precarious, mm -hmm. conditions. So this is something I think we should keep in context when we discuss mm -hmm. yeah. And the chores are very, yeah, mm -hmm. much mm -hmm. part of the landscape. Okay, so that's a comment I guess doesn't apply. Um, I'm a Berkeley resident. My name is Charlie Costello. I've traveled to Burma a couple times. I've lived in Japan. Um, Thinking of boycotts, um, maybe we could use on Sun Suchi's own recipe of boycotting tourism. Mm -hmm. And if we had, I don't like to say that because I love Burma and I don't want to not go there, but that's a really good place to start to be tourist dollars. Is okay. Absolutely. Yeah, tourism, and I see people having conferences. I mean, I've been there three times before 2017, but you know. We thought, yeah, there are ways to think about it. I saw other hands, yeah. Yeah, I was wondering, like, in the discussion on the U.S. and things as the U.S. can do, um, in discussions around this crisis about a year ago, there was a lot more talk about how Facebook was part of the perpetuation mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. genocide. Um, and I was wondering what your thoughts were on the, um, like, how to maneuver or push changes in technology and privacy in some senses, or what you could see being different to stop this kind of situation from happening again via social media? Um, sure, I'll take a stab at it. Uh, I'll be an imperfect one. Um, uh, I think that um, Facebook was a platform for amplifying hate speech in Myanmar. Um, but it wasn't the only platform. Um, it was a symptom of a much broader uh, set of problems. And uh, I think that you can address the symptoms, but it's also important to think about the root causes and, and address those root causes. Um, and I, this touches upon something that, that you mentioned um, earlier in your reflections in terms of uh, the, the notion of democracy, especially in the West, and, and I think that in the Myanmar context there is <coughs> this very misplaced notion that uh, in 2015, mm -hmm. with the elections taking place, that there would be a clear path towards a liberal, pluralistic mm -hmm. democracy, and what actually happened and what we're seeing, I think, happen in a lot of other places as well, is uh, um, uh, a regression to the mean <coughs> and a uh, mobilization around ethnicity and religion and uh, in the case of Myanmar it's uh, a majoritarian and Buddhist chauvinist approach mm -hmm. to politics mm -hmm. at the exclusion of, of anyone besides um, that that majority um, 
And so I think that's that's part of the root which Facebook played a role in, mm -hmm. um, though uh, I think belatedly they, Facebook has mm -hmm. taken some measures to try and address the situation, um, has acknowledged some wrongdoing uh, to an extent, not as much as uh, probably is warranted. Um, and uh, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll stop there. The, uh, on tourism, uh, I don't know the hard numbers, but I think that there's been a significant decrease in Western tourism, um, mm -hmm. albeit an increase in Asian tourism, um, especially from Chinese uh, tourists, uh, which um, don't bring in as much money. So the um, uh, the impact, uh, I, don't, I don't know what the net impact is, um, but there's been a significant decrease in, in tourism from, from Western countries. I have a general question here. So why do you think that Bangladesh is not signing the refugee convention? Mm. What can we, I mean, because the refugees will get benefits. And is it bad for Bangladesh or they will be not? <laughs> why? My understanding, and it's not the first time that it came out, a long time, Bangladesh, especially the first time it came out in the 1990s, practically, the, the wave that came. At that point was the conversation. But it didn't work out. Primary argument that I have heard from those who were close to the government uh, is that it provides certain rights to the refugees, involves the resources, and commitment to accepting some of the refugees in a different manner. So there are various levels of it. You know, that's why the, the Bangladesh government was unwilling to sign because it it would provide, it would uh, compel them to take certain steps which now they can ignore. They might have been doing it, but they have, they're not required. It's mm. not imperative mm -hmm. for them. They're not, being, uh, they're not being held responsible or accountable for them. not doing that. So, so is it possible that they are getting uh, like a foreign donations, UN organizations and other funding for to support the refugees at this point? After signing that, like even if there is no uh, outside resources, they will have to maintain. Them, right? Right. They so will they have to put re strain on their own resources. Right, St resources right. is a question. If you are committed to it, you will have to do it, whether yeah. you receive support or not. There is no way. But that remains. Reality remains. That let's say, let's say it's not going to happen. Hopefully, it's not going to happen. Tomorrow, all funding is stuck. What is going? To, what Bangladesh will do? You know, will they, mm -hmm. will they be able to? Uh, push this, you know, millions of people inside Myanmar. No, that's not going to happen. Uh, and Bangladesh policy have, you uh, know, in a, in, a, in a fashion it has changed. If you if you look at this this phase of the current iteration of the situation, 2017. Remember the first reaction of Bangladesh. What was the first reaction? They offered Myanmar to have joint patrol at the border. Mm -hmm and said, we are not going to allow a <coughs> yeah. Remember what was the international reaction? ARSA is the terrorist organization yeah. supported with ISIS. You know, when I kept on saying that this is, this is not true, this is not true, and with a little bit of background, not much, on working on an uh, uh, you know, uh, international terrorist organization, transnational terrorist organization, I kept on saying that this is not. In Bangladesh, quote-unquote security experts, have been insisting that ARSA, not to mention the West, not to mention the international media, mm -hmm. kept on saying that ARSA is, oh, it is I connected to ISIS. They said, it doesn't show any indication of that. This is how everything was framed at that point, to securitize the whole thing and giving a uh, so-called international, transnational terrorist frame. Uh, let me make a just quick thing that you mentioned about the Obama administration's policy with yeah. respect to uh, which I describe as, you know, no stick all carrot policy that uh, yeah. you know, Obama has nice extended. Uh, <coughs> there were conversations, of course, there were criticism at that point. Again, it was a great game. Yeah. You know, if you can pull Myanmar out of Chinese influence, this is their moment, they thought. And exactly the same thing flipped, 2017. Mm. Uh, China thought, back to the game again, because the West is criticizing. Uh, the you know 
Aung San Suu Kyi, who was considered to be the idol of everything, democracy, human rights, you know, Nobel laureate, blah, 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 all sorts of things, right? Uh, uh, and she was liked by the West. So Beijing didn't like it. When West didn't like her, yay, the Beijing came down, you know, in 2017, we are going to protect you, come what? That is the, that is the great game being played. Unfortunately, and this, this in this thing, the democracy played a part, or the rhetoric of democracy played a part, but just a part. Can I make yeah, a couple of additions? We do have this sort of yeah, neo-colonial great game going on, as you well put. Uh, yes, Naveen, did you want to say something about the 1951 uh, convention and why Bangladesh isn't signing it? Refugee convention or no? Concerns have been persistent fears going back to the late 70s. And then on top of that, um, especially since 2017, Bangladesh hasn't wanted to do anything that will alleviate pressure on Myanmar. Um, and if it were to improve the situation for Rohingya in Bangladesh, um, it would reduce, in theory, it would reduce the pressure on Myanmar to create conditions there to accept them for return. Um, and then the only other very quick point that I wanted to make on, um, on U.S. policy, it, when the U.S. lifted sanctions in November 2016, um, at that point, I think the writing was on the wall for sanctions. Everyone else had lifted sanctions. And in the past couple of years, uh, between 2016 and 2017, and, and certainly since then, investment from the West hasn't materialized in the way that was expected. It's been, as, as you showed in your slides, it's been entirely from um, countries within the region. Um, so I think symbolically it was, it was a really important decision, especially coming just a month after the first set of attacks by ARSA mm -hmm. and the first yeah. wave of, mm -hmm. of Rohingya being forcibly uh, displaced to, to Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the practical impact on um, uh, on Myanmar's economy, I think, was probably overstated. Okay. Right. Unlike, say, a place like wherever, Iran, where these sanctions, yeah. 
would have made a big difference. Yeah. Okay. Um, we still have five minutes left for any. Yeah. Go ahead, and then uh, yeah. Well, we can. I think we have time for both, but yeah. Yeah. So this is specifically for Patrick. But anyone else who wants to join in? Come here from the back. Um, the question for Patrick, uh, but anyone else who can join in um, can, but I'm interested in your framing of the Rohingya being moved to Bashan Shore as a kind of climate adaptation um, technology, and I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit more about that, um, potentially in two ways. So one way is uh, Bangladesh is projected to have uh, one of the highest numbers of climate migrants or climate refugees in the world. Um, in the coming decades, and I was wondering if you've spoken to anyone in Bangladesh or just through your own work on um, how people there are conceptualizing the Rohingya in those terms, um, as you mentioned, and if that's actually like something that's happening on a policy level um, in those words. And second, I wonder if you've thought a bit about um, this idea of statelessness and how it can refer to like legally refer to political refugees like the Rohingya, but also climate refugees. Um, and as we're like thinking about, um, like, uh, thinking kind of beyond the nation state, um, as you kind of frame this as a climate adaptation technology, I wonder if there are some parallels between kind of the legality of like climate refugees and political refugees, and how you are conceptualizing the move to this island. I would say that, generally speaking, no one un no one understands necessarily the island project as precisely that kind of experiment. But what I'm thinking is, it can't help but do that. Mm. I mean, this is a situation where a lot of resources and expertise have been mobilized in order to solidify this island, and the people that are have been working on it are the same firms in many cases that in China have been building islands in the South China Sea in order to establish sovereignty there mm -hmm. and actually that we're working on uh, designing the wor countries of the world islands that are in the Emirates. Mm -hmm. And so it's not a matter of you know, designing this experimental apparatus in order to then take back, but just because of the circulations that the engineers and the planners are involved in, it can't help but produce knowledge like that. Mm -hmm. Especially because I think Bangladesh is sort of the site of experimentation, as always been it from <laughs> one love <laughs> onwards, you yeah. know. It's always, yeah. Eight love. It, the aid lab, exactly. Right, right, right. And um, what's her face in Canada? Yeah, like Michelle Murphy. Mm -hmm. That's been about yeah, uh, one last question. Um, maybe we can take, yeah. Just to comment again, I, I really like to uh, bring you on this issue about the climate adaptation technology. It's not something we had thought of. But it's uh, certainly not what Nadine said is to have them out of sight because 100,000 going out shifting to Bashanchal is not going to get them out of sight. Huh. Right. Oh, that's right. interesting. They, uh, I mean, but yeah, that's. I think that that's important too because mm -hmm. it's. They're not. It's not even going to make that <coughs> big of a dent to move all these people to this island. So why do it? Why why put all of this energy mm -hmm. into making this island if yeah. it's if it's only going to be a relatively small percentage of them anyway? There the, the, uh, there is other other equation inside. I mean, if you go back and look, who actually was in charge of building the whole thing? There we yeah. go. <laughs> there yeah. we go. So that's you have to take that nice. into account too. Yeah. You know, the British company, the Chinese, Chinese took the lead in this. The British provided mm -hmm. the technology, yeah. and the Navy provided the manpower, mm -hmm. and the government was very happy to keep right. some people happy. Uh, you know. There is another game that is being played yes. here that we simply cannot ignore. I wish we could. Yes. There is a performance. Absolutely. But there is this performance of how of doing something, performance of power, things are happening, right? And they do, you don't need to be, you're making these people more visible 
by this whole act of putting them there. So we're doing something. Yes, we're so doing something. That is that what is the government the, is, is the performing message. governmentality right. and making and visibly, and it has to do it visibly because in that sense. Moving 100,000 people is going not even to make any dent okay. in a million people, right? Yeah. But the point oh, is, see, <laughs> we are doing something. Yeah. No, I think, yeah. Is it a statement of the government to the people, the own people also? Yes. Yeah. That's, that's where the governmentality part comes <laughs> in too, right? It's doing what it's meant to do. We are doing something, but we are not causing you problems. We you are Bangladesh are not yeah. going to be a rich. We are doing everything. We are very <coughs> cunning and so on and so forth. Okay, it, is, it is somewhat awkward we can ask, yeah. in, in terms of the domestic politics of it, though, because when you start telling your domestic constitu constituencies that you're spending $300 million yeah, of government I money know. without any international support on uh, an island that's going to be for Rohingya, where at least the, the physical structures mm -hmm. are much better than yeah. the average Bangladesh you might have, that complicates the picture mm -hmm. of it. True. Okay, one last question and then we're closing, yeah. Because mm -hmm. we're sort of on time, yeah. Yeah, please. I don't, uh, so since uh, we know that this average encampment of the refugees like 17 to 22 years or 25, I don't know how long. So it's not a like a short-term problem. And there are, uh, as you mentioned uh, in your talk, that uh, there are like a resentment among the host communities now. So to make the, and Bangladesh is not signing the convention, so to make their life a little better or tolerable or keeping their communities in harmony, like so that they can live side by side. So what are the international organizations doing or what can be done? Do yeah, it's a complicated question. Um, I think uh, it's worth highlighting that Cox's Bazar is among the poorest districts in Bangladesh even predating this crisis. So there were significant grievances that these communities had against the central government that predate the major influx of, of the Rohingya recently. Um, but they now have a platform that they didn't have before to, to raise those grievances, mm -hmm. some of which are directly linked to the Rohingya, some of which are not. Um, in terms of the how to manage the situation, uh, I think it's, it's quite challenging uh, because mm -hmm. from a central government perspective, you don't want there to be conflict or security challenges uh, between the Rohingya and the affected Bangladeshi communities. But at the same time, you don't want integration because integration leads to permanence um, and you don't move towards that overarching objective of, of repatriation. Um, uh, so uh, that complicates the picture a little bit. Um, in terms of what the international community, the UN and the NGOs, in, in terms of their response, um, I think this is an issue that they arrived at belatedly. Um, the joint response plans, which are the annual plans that, that govern how humanitarian assistance is provided. Um, going back to, to 2018, 25% of that funding was meant to go towards affected Bangladeshi communities. Um, some of it towards ameliorating tension between Bangladeshi communities and, and Rohingya. Um, I, I think that the actual amount of spending is probably considerably less than that, given that the, those plans have been funded at only 70%. Um, and the delay in, in focus has created tension between the humanitarian stakeholders and, um, and the local <coughs> Bangladeshi communities, where there's been uh, significant protests. There's a very strong localization movement uh, to try and uh, capture some of the benefits of the, the humanitarian response. Um, uh, the communities in Cox's Bazaar feel left out to an extent uh, that uh, it's actually Bangladeshis from Chittagong or Dhaka or elsewhere that are getting the jobs that have the technical skills to be able to um, to fulfill those roles. Um, so I, I think it's something that is is being looked at, but uh, is is complicated by the central government dynamics around uh, wanting there to be. Uh, peace, but not uh, not uh, interlinkages and, and integration between the local Bangladeshi communities in the Rohingya. Thank you. Well, thank you for a fantastic panel, and thank you, Naveen, for staying on the phone with us. <laughs> 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 you are wonderful.